When the first Germanic settlers from northwestern Europe arrived in Britain, they were officially landing in the province of Britannia, one of the far-flung corners of the Roman Empire. But they would not have found there the dynamic and prosperous province of Hadrian's day. No, these were the waning decades of Roman rule. And it was in this crucible of decline that England would be forged. Before we dive into these final years, let's briefly recap the rise and fall of Roman Britain. Prior to the Roman conquest, Britain was inhabited by a variety of tribes speaking dialects of the Celtic family of languages. These dialects are referred to by linguists as Britonic, and Britonic is the ancestor of the later Celtic languages we know of surviving today in Britain as Welsh and Cornish, and in Brittany as Breton. The Britonic peoples, or Britons, practiced agriculture and engaged in trade with each other and with the Roman world, particularly in the southeast, which had always been open to contacts with the continent. This openness to the continent foreshadowed the essential divide between the trade-oriented south and east and the more pastorally oriented north and west of Britain. Some of these tribal groupings were large and powerful, and their leaders sometimes lived in large hill forts, particularly in the south and west, though these were not nearly as well developed as the hill forts of the continental Celtic speakers whom Julius Caesar confronted during his campaigns in Gaul in the 50s BC. The tribes in Britain, in some cases, had close ties to the tribes in Gaul, and it was partly in an effort to forestall military aid to the Gaulish tribes that Caesar conducted exploratory campaigns in Britain in 55 and 54 BC. Neither campaign amounted to much, and it was another century before the Romans decided to get serious about conquering Britain. In 44 AD, the Emperor Claudius was seeking a way to burnish his lackluster military reputation, so he ordered a major expedition to Britain, and he accompanied the invasion himself, though he was no soldier and took no part in the actual fighting. The Romans rather rapidly conquered the various tribes of southern Britain who were not able to unite, particularly as many tribes differed on whether to collaborate with the Romans or resist them. Having asserted control, the Romans then established villa-based agriculture in the fertile and arable plains of the south and east of Britain, which prospered for centuries. The hillier north and west of Britain was better suited to grazing and pastoral farming but the Romans were also forced to install an extensive military infrastructure in these regions to hold down their more rebellious inhabitants. This geographical divide is still a feature of life in Britain today, even though it has been a long time since agriculture dominated the British economy. The Britons of the lowland south and east were rather quickly converted to a Roman way of life, with bouts of periodic resistance. The most serious came when Boudica, the queen of the Iceni, revolted in 61 AD due to mistreatment by Roman imperial officials. It was a close-run thing for Roman rule in Britain, and Boudica was able to sack and burn the Roman commercial settlement at Londinium. The layer of ash from the fire she started is still visible in the ground. Her revolt was ultimately suppressed, however, and order in the southeast was restored. But the north and west required a constant military presence, so Britain was always brimming with soldiers, at least on the fringes of Roman-ruled territory. In the north, the Romans faced the hostile Caledonians, and they saw less of an advantage in investing in the troops required to hold the rugged lands of what is now northern England and Scotland. So they decided to draw a kind of stone line in the sand by building what we know as 
Hadrian's Wall. A less formidable barrier, known as the Antonine Wall, was built a few decades later, some hundred miles to the north, but swiftly abandoned. Hadrian's Wall represented the northern limes, or limit, of the Roman Empire. The wall did not act as an impermeable barrier. It was more of a point of contact, and trade and people flowed freely back and forth across the wall. Still, this was a heavily militarized zone. Archaeologists have found extensive evidence of the long settlement of the legions along the wall. Hadrian's Wall is the most visible reminder of the Roman presence in Britain. But it really didn't create a meaningful border beyond the Roman period. And, in particular, it would not become the border between England and Scotland. Roman towns and cities quickly developed in the territory south of the Wall. As in many other Roman provinces, these towns were constructed on a grid pattern, with many of the amenities that Romans would have come to expect in their Italian homeland. There would be temples, of course, but also a forum area for conducting public business and trade, and an arena for public games. Public bathhouses were a must. The natural springs at Aquae Sulis, which we know today as the town of Bath, were famous even outside of Britain. There were also small manufacturing businesses that emerged in the towns, taking advantage of the Roman trade networks. The most important trading center in Roman Britain was Londinium, today London, on the Thames River. Londinium had already been used as a port by the Britons before the Romans arrived. The other important centers in Britain were York, Chester, and Lincoln. The Roman road system connected all these settlements, but in some cases, the roads were built on existing native trackways. The inhabitants of Britain knew their own landscape and made prudent decisions about how to take advantage of the topography to create the most efficient routes across the countryside. The Roman engineers, in many cases, had no desire to tamper with what was not broken. For example, the famous Watling Street, which runs from Dover in the southeast to Roxeter in the northwest, was built on an existing route from the pre-Roman era. Later, British transportation engineers could not improve much upon this earlier work, and it is still the basis for parts of the roads known as the A2 and the A5. And outside of the major population centers, much of Britain carried on as it always had. In agriculture, for example, traditional field systems and practices continued. We know from archaeology that some field patterns had already existed for thousands of years by the time the Romans came. These were some of the same patterns that would persist through the period of Germanic settlement as well. There was a long tradition in the countryside that waves of newcomers did not really do much to alter. But there were some very distinctly Roman enclaves in the midst of this landscape. In the prosperous south and east, villa life on the Italian model, with estates supported by slave labor, flourished for several centuries. These villas could be quite large, but they varied considerably in size, and many of their owners were probably members of the existing native elite who had simply adopted a Roman lifestyle. There were clearly some villas that belonged to people of middling rank, one villa from Verulamium, modern St. Albans, boasted prefab mosaics, a far cheaper alternative to the customized mosaics that would have graced the villas of the truly wealthy. In other words, this was a stratified society with a flourishing economy that could support the kind of social aspirations that the villa owners in Verulamium were engaged in. In addition to agriculture and small manufacturing, Britain was also renowned for its extractive industries, particularly the tin mining of the Southwest. Cornwall had been a source of tin for the Mediterranean 
as far back as the second millennium BC, and the Romans further developed the potential of the tin mines. The remains of Roman mining operations are still quite visible in the landscape of this part of Britain. Economically then, Roman Britain did well for the first two centuries or so. It was obviously on the periphery of the Roman Empire, but it was very much integrated within it through networks of trade, through the military, and through imperial taxation. During this time, Christianity spread to Britain, probably at some point during the third century, which was a period of explosive growth in Christianity throughout the empire. The new faith was likely confined to the urban areas and the Roman villas. Many Christian artifacts have been found in these places. This is going to be very important going forward because when the Germanic settlers arrived, they were going to find a mixed religious landscape. There was certainly plenty of Christian worship in the Romanized areas, but there was also quite a bit of pagan practice and probably both Roman cults and pre-existing native cults were being observed, especially in the countryside. The cultural prestige of the later pagan Germanic settlers may have led to the extinction of much of the Christian worship that the Romans had established. But Christianity was not totally wiped out, and it was actually doing well in the North and West. So there was at least a seed from which Christianity could regrow, even if it required a major graft from both the continent and Ireland in order to do so. Linguistically, the situation in Roman Britain was similarly mixed. In the towns in particular, there was probably a great deal of bilingualism. We have a large number of curse tablets that survive from Aquae Sulis. These are inscriptions on slate tablets that were ritually deposited in the waters there as a way of communicating with the gods. And they often included curses against someone's enemies. Saturninus stole my cloak, the bastard, etc. These were in Latin. But we know that Britonic languages also continued to be spoken. There are place names that survive into the Anglo-Saxon times that are Britonic in origin. And while we cannot always tell how old these names are, they certainly indicate some degree of linguistic continuity. The situation in Britain thus offers an interesting contrast to Gaul where the Celtic language spoken there at the time of the Roman conquest, known as Gaulish, seems to have gone completely out of use. Britain was never as thoroughly Romanized as Gaul, so when the Germanic settlers arrived in Britain, they were in a different situation from, say, the Franks who settled in Gaul. Culturally, the Franks were largely absorbed by the Gallo-Romans, but in Britain, as we will see, it was the other way around. So now that we've described Roman Britain at its height, we need to talk about what happened to cause its decline. Scholars don't agree on exactly when the Romano-British economy started to decline. Some put the downturn in the late third century, some in the early fourth, but one thing is clear. The trajectory of the economy was downward beginning at some point round about 300 or so. How do we know this? The archeological record tells the tale. Previously, residents of Britain had had access to manufactured goods from all over the Roman Empire. This was part of the integration into Roman life that had resulted from the conquest. There was a particularly active trade in pottery, as there were extensive ceramic manufacturing centers in southern Gaul, and the goods they produced were shipped up the Rhone River and then down the Seine, whence they were shipped to Britain. There were even pots from as far away as North Africa, which was another major center of ceramic production. But there were also local ceramic manufacturers in Britain that produced lower quality, but still quite serviceable pottery. So people had a choice of price ranges. They could even buy different kinds of pots for different uses, 
the way a modern family might buy their everyday china from one source and their fine china from another. This kind of market differentiation is the sign of a thriving economy. But in the fourth century, we start to see a decline in manufacturing, and by the fifth century, trade from the continent has dried up, particularly in the south and east, which had previously been the region that was most open to trade with the rest of the empire. To give one tangible example of this decline, consider this: wheel-thrown pottery was no longer widely made in Britain by the fifth century. And would not be produced again in large quantities for hundreds of years. Wheel-thrown pots are far superior to hand-formed pots. They are more regular in shape, more stable, and less prone to defects. And they are easier to mass produce. If people in the ancient world had access to them, they always opted for them. But they require specialized tools. And expert potters to produce them at a commercially viable scale. So the decline of their production tells us that the market for these items had simply dried up, and with it, an entire industry had downshifted to a more rudimentary form. Think about what a step backward that must have been to suddenly find yourself living in a world where everyday objects you once took for granted. Had become extremely rare. Archaeology can tell us other quite worrisome things about how the economy was doing. For one thing, there is evidence that people in Britain were scavenging among ruins for anything usable they could find, especially manufactured metal goods like nails and other hardware. This tells us that the building industry had basically shut down. As had ancillary businesses like iron forging. Today, one metric that economists use to tell how well the economy is thriving is the level of steel production, because it's a proxy for all sorts of other things that the economy makes, like cars, appliances, and heavy manufacturing machines. Iron forging was the same kind of indicator in the ancient world. Archaeologists have noted that the level of iron slag being produced at the end of the Roman Empire declined sharply. The demand for iron had simply collapsed. In Britain, we see this collapse in another very interesting way in the archaeological record. Normally, archaeologists use changing fashions in jewelry and other articles of dress and adornment to establish the date of a find. This works because fashions do tend to shift. We can tell the difference between a kind of brooch that was popular in the first century from one that was popular in the second century. But this process of relative dating gets very difficult in late Roman Britain, because in addition to scavenging for usable metal in ruins, people were also passing down heirlooms rather than changing their fashions in jewelry. With the same regularity as before, and again, this was a sign that people were clinging rather desperately to what they had, because they could not easily replace these objects. So, what caused this economic collapse? The reason this question is so difficult to answer is because there was a great deal of political instability in this period. And it's hard to say whether the economic troubles caused the political instability, or the other way around. It is certainly true that political instability is bad for business. Quite apart from the disruption to trade caused by military threats, if people are worried about their safety, they are going to take fewer economic risks. So that will depress demand all by itself. But it's also true. That people whose livelihood is under threat are far more likely to become disgruntled with the powers that be. Scholars disagree among themselves about what caused what, but something bad was clearly happening in late Roman Britain. We've sketched the downturn in the economy. Let's talk now about the political crisis.
the Roman Empire generally was engulfed in this time by the so-called third century crisis. During this period, Rome was rocked by repeated political upheavals and by military threats on its borders. And during the middle third of the century, the empire literally broke apart into three pieces. Despite its distance from Rome, Britain was at many times center stage during the crisis. And the fragmentation of the empire had a direct impact on the integrity of Britain's defenses against its barbarian enemies, who were coming not just from north of Hadrian's Wall, but also from along the southern coasts, where waves of barbarian raiders and dislocated peoples had begun to land. Very importantly for our story, in 286, a Roman naval commander named Carousius took advantage of the chaos and briefly took control of Britain, declaring himself emperor there. During his brief reign, he called in Frisians and Saxons to help shore up the defenses of the island along the southeastern coast. That section of coast later became known as the Saxon Shore, though historians are not sure whether this was because Saxons had been called in to defend it, or because Saxons were the people the shore needed to be defended against. There could be a little bit of retrospective branding going on here, because Saxons would later raid along the coast and then settle in Britain. But the name conveys a basic truth. The enemies of Rome were not slow to take advantage of these internal squabbles, with Britain often playing a starring role. The father of Emperor Constantine, Constantius I, having deposed the impostor Carousius, was still serving in Britain when he was elevated to the purple by his troops, whereupon he left for the continent and his imperial destiny, a path that many later would-be usurpers would tread. But let's go back to Carousius's Frisians and Saxons. Who were they? It is helpful here, I think, to make a quick tour of the barbarian landscape of Northwestern Europe. Keep in mind that the names of peoples that I am going to cite are extremely vague indications of what we might think of as ethnicity. Ethnic identity was very fluid in this period. Peoples on the move often swept up additional followers as they went along, and people could and did switch cultural allegiance quite readily. But that said, we need at least some indication of who was on the board, so here goes. The most important barbarians for our purposes are the residents of the coastal regions of Northwestern Europe. Moving north from Roman Gaul, there were the Frisians, mostly in what is now Belgium and the Netherlands. Continuing north and east along the coast into today's Germany, we find the Saxons and a bit further east, the Angles, whose territory extended north into what is now Denmark. These are going to be the most important groups who sent settlers to Britain. They would have all spoken closely related dialects of the Western branch of the Germanic family of languages. And likely these groups would have been able to communicate with each other. But there is another group of people we need to introduce, not because they will settle in Britain in large numbers, but because they will end up dominating Northwestern Europe after the fall of Rome, namely the Franks. During the later fourth century, the Franks had begun infiltrating Northern Gaul and over the course of the 5th century, they slowly but surely hollowed out the Roman administration in Gaul until, in 486, the last Roman imperial official, Syagrius, was defeated at the Battle of Soissons by Clovis, the first acknowledged king of the Franks. There is some controversy over exactly how the Roman government in Britain responded to the threat from Northwestern Europe. But the Saxon shore played an increasingly important role in the defensive strategy of the island, with forts built along the southeast coast. 
Most of the time, the forts were adequate for repelling small nuisance raids. But the so-called barbarian conspiracy in 367 represented the most serious threat to Roman rule since Boudicca's revolt. In that year, Britain was attacked virtually simultaneously by several barbarian peoples, the Scotti from Ireland, the Picts from Scotland, and the Atticotti, the Franks, and the Saxons from northwestern Europe. It is hard to grasp exactly how these various tribes were able to coordinate their activities, but somehow they must have done so, because the defensive resources, even of the heavily militarized province of Britain, were overwhelmed. To make matters worse, the disorder occasioned by the raids led many Roman soldiers in Britain to desert and join in the plundering. The reason this event matters for our purposes is that we see here one inflection point in the relationship between the Germanic peoples and the island of Britain. After this period, contact between Britain and these peoples seems to have increased. There are signs that there had been a Germanic presence in Britain already for a considerable period even before the barbarian conspiracy. From the third century, the Romans had begun enlisting Germans into the legions at an accelerated rate in an attempt to co-opt them. There were Germans stationed in such far-flung regions of the empire as Egypt and Syria. This dynamic later caused more Germans to want to enter Roman territory. Word got back to the soldiers' relatives beyond the borders, and migrations resulted. Something similar may have happened with German soldiers stationed with the Roman legions in Britain. The savior of Roman Britain at the time of the barbarian conspiracy was the father of the future Roman emperor Theodosius the Great, also named Theodosius, who arrived in 368 and was able to stabilize the situation. But 15 years later, when the Roman Empire was still reeling from the disastrous defeat and death of the Eastern Emperor Valens at the Battle of Adrianople in 378, a Roman general named Magnus Maximus rebelled against Emperor Gratian and took several legions with him out of Britain to the continent to pursue his ultimately unsuccessful claim to the imperial throne. He was never replaced with a commander of equivalent stature. Progressively, Britain was being denuded of its military strength and its borders were becoming more porous. And as the situation for the Roman administration became increasingly desperate, Britain slipped farther and farther down on the priority list. The details of the Roman withdrawal from Britain are murky, but I want to sketch them at least in outline because they provide an important indication of what things were like in the period when large waves of Germanic migrants began to settle in Britain, namely, very unstable. At the very end of the year 406, a motley barbarian horde of Franks, Burgundians, and Vandals took advantage of an exceptionally cold winter, crossed the frozen Rhine, and rampaged throughout Gaul. In response, a Roman general in Britain named Constantius was raised to the purple as Constantine III and departed for Gaul, stripping the province of its legions in order to respond to the Frankish threat. In 410, the leaders of the Romano-British community, tired of being left defenseless, expelled the remaining officials of this usurping emperor. They then appealed directly to the Emperor Honorius for help. They were initially met with silence. Understandable, perhaps, as Rome had been sacked that year by the Visigoths. The following year, 411, we have a curious text called the Rescript of Honorius, in which the Emperor tells the cities of Britain to look to their own defenses. There is some dispute about whether this document refers to Roman Britain or to the cities of Brutium in southern Italy, 
We don't have a mention of this document until the 6th century. But if it did apply to Britain, then it represents the last official communication that we know of between Britain and the Roman Empire. But regardless, we can be sure that the Roman Empire was disconnected from Britain from this point on, and it must have been rough. One of our most vivid sources for this period is a text called On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain by the Romano-British monk Gildas. Gildas is one of the most important sources we have for this period. He was one of the few who thought to record the decline of Roman Britain and the arrival of the Germanic peoples. But Gildas was writing over a hundred years after the events he describes, so it's not always clear what his sources are. Nevertheless, he records that the Romano-British authorities wrote to the imperial government and begged for help. This appeal is dated to between 446 and 454 AD, and it was addressed to the Roman general Flavius Aetius. According to Gildas, it read, to Aetius, thrice consul, the groans of the Britons. The barbarians drive us to the sea. The sea drives us to the barbarians. Between these two means of death, we are either killed or drowned. There was no reply. So what are we to make of Britain in the late 4th and early 5th centuries? It was on the decline economically, its horizons had shrunk in every way, and it was increasingly subject to incursions from overseas. Some were warlike, others fairly peaceful, but regardless, the door was open. <laughs>